Hello and welcome to Worship at Cumber Methodist. You are very welcome whether you're joining us online or via our telephone service or by some other means. Whether you are by yourself or joining in worship with others, we want to say that you're very welcome and you are part of God's worshipping family today. My name is Michael Spence and I'll be leading this week's service as we think about what it means um, to forgive and to be forgiven. I want to begin by reading some words from Psalm 103, um, the lyrics of a song written by King David, thinking about what it means that God forgives us and loves us. Let's hear these words. Praise the Lord my soul, all my inmost being, praise his holy name. Praise the Lord, my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your sins and heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit and crowns you with love and compassion who satisfies your desires with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. The Lord works righteousness and justice for all the oppressed. He made known his ways to Moses, his deeds to the people of Israel. The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love. He will not always accuse, nor will he harbour his anger forever. He does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. Let's pray. Almighty God, we thank you for who you are. We thank you, God, that you are love itself, that you are holy, that you are mighty, that you're powerful. Thank you, God, that you are a God of justice and a God of mercy. And Lord, as we come to you in worship today, uh, we thank you that we can do that because of the freedom that Jesus has won for us. And Lord, as we come to you together, as we uh, worship you in song and uh, through prayer, um, and as we worship you with our minds thinking about what we hear in scripture, God, may it all be acceptable as worship to you. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.
persuades from pole to pole that war may cease and all be prayer and praise his reign shall know no end and round his pierced feet fair flowers of paradise extend their fragrance ever sweet It's good to be with you, and if you are watching the service beginning at half ten on Sunday, then you're joining me live at my kitchen table. Uh, and it's live so that as we uh, gather and share this meal that Jesus commanded us to share, uh, we are, uh, in another sense, gathered together in time, if not uh, in space. And so wherever you are, if you're at home, uh, if you're by yourself, if you're with others, I want to do uh, this thing together. Jesus gave us this meal, simple meal of bread and wine, uh, and asked all his disciples to do this in remembrance of him, uh, to eat and drink, uh, call to mind all that Jesus uh, has done for us and is doing for us, and allow that to feed us in our spirits. And so we're going to be doing that a little later on in our time together. So if you've not done so yet, I encourage you to pop to the kitchen and get whatever you have. If you've got bread and grape juice, brilliant. Or if you've got um, a cracker and a glass of water, anything uh, that can connect us together in this meal that Jesus commanded us to share. And as we continue in worship together, we want to pray for our world and its needs. Chris is going to lead us. So let's pray together. Almighty God, we do thank you that we can approach your throne of grace with the confidence of children coming to their father. In recent months, our attention has been drawn to those who are vulnerable. As we pray for them now, we remember that in our weakness, your strength is made perfect. We bring to you those who are vulnerable because of their health or other factors that make them more susceptible to COVID-19. We ask for their protection and recovery for those suffering from COVID-19. We pray for those who feel vulnerable because they have not been able to have investigations carried out and treatment done during the pandemic. We do ask that the NHS will soon be able to function as normally as possible. May we all play our part in doing what is necessary to reduce our vulnerability and the vulnerability of others, and do bless the work of those working on treatments and vaccines for COVID-19. We pray that people may act responsibly to try and prevent clusters of infection arising as they are doing at present. We pray for help and protection for those who have become more vulnerable to poverty, unemployment, mental illness and abuse as a result of COVID-19. Please may all those whose occupation makes them vulnerable to infection have adequate measures provided for them to keep them safe. Father, 
Across the world, we are all vulnerable to the effects of climate change and environmental issues, produced by our poor stewardship of your wonderful creation. May nations work together to address these issues and please use all organisations which address and respond to poverty, drought, famine, flooding and other disasters. Millions of people are vulnerable to the effects of war and terrorism. We do ask you to intervene and to bring peace to South Sudan, Syria, Yemen and all other areas of conflict. Please be with all refugees and enable those working to help them in their camps. We are also all vulnerable to various disasters at any time. And we especially pray for the people of Beirut and Lebanon following the recent explosion, especially remembering the bereaved and the injured. We pray for those seeking to bring comfort and to treat them. We pray that the country will receive the help they need to cope with this situation at this time. We ourselves are vulnerable to temptation, to doubts, fears, lack of faith, lack of zeal and selfishness when we do not put you first in our lives and think of ourselves before the needs of others. Please give us the desire and determination to trust you, to rely on you and follow you as devoted disciples, ready to share the gospel and show your love. Father, we pray that your church across the world will be faithful to point people to the sure and certain hope that we have in you, which is through faith in our Lord Jesus, the rock where we find security in our vulnerability, the rock in whose name we pray these things. Amen.
Sometimes we think of forgiveness as just letting things go. You know, in our culture, we often sweep small offences and hurts under the carpet because it's convenient. I mean, confrontation might be embarrassing. We want to avoid conflict, so we act as if nothing happened. And we call that forgiveness. And we come to expect people to overlook certain things. But this story reminds us that there is nothing ordinary about forgiveness. <laughs> what happens when you are not the direct victim? Can you, should you forgive a crime committed towards someone you love? He went to the park, I passed him on the way, so I just beeped and waved. So that would have been the last time I would have seen him alive. They got racially abused at the bus stop while they were waiting, and they walked away to get to the, to the next bus stop to get away from the confrontation. Two boys drove ahead of them and waited for them in the park. And then they attacked Anthony with an ice axe and he didn't make it. The family of the murdered teenager, Anthony Walker, has made an emotional appeal for help in catching his... This killer. has been a difficult day here in Heighton for the local community. Anthony Walker was killed with an axe last Friday night. Police say the murder was racially motivated. I need to find out. Everyone saying here needs to find out who did this to my little brother, my 18-year-old brother. They didn't go into detail, they just they told us that Anthony had been killed. All I remember at that time is just falling to the floor and I was crying. Kids love him. He took time out for them. And you know, his passion was basketball, he teaches them basketball. He likes to rap, he likes to dance. So we teach kids all those things. Detectives are questioning another two men arrested at Liverpool Airport last night. The two young men were immediately arrested on suspicion of murder. When I found out what happened and then I found out who, who actually did it, um, I'd known them since school. One of the boys, in fact, I'd known since from nursery all the way up. I've seen those children grow up together. I saw them in the playground and sports day playing together. Yeah, what they did, I don't condone what they did. It's terribly wrong. But I expect the law to work for me. It's not up to me to take revenge. This evening, his sister Dominique came to look at the tributes. Well, I've been here and back all day, so I just want to say thank you to everybody um, from the family. Um, it's helped us a lot. There's a lot of support from the community, a lot of support from everybody. I was approached by a reporter and he asked me if I, find, if I could find in my heart to forgive the killers of Anthony, knowing that I'm a woman of, obviously a woman of God, a woman of faith. And I said, I stopped for a second and I was just like, I obviously had to think, but not, it wasn't, for me it probably seemed like a lifetime that I had to think, but it must have been 
less than a few seconds and I said to him, I says, the Bible taught us that and Jesus said 70 times seven we must forgive and that's what we must do. And then the whole place went quiet because everyone else was just looking at me as if to say, oh my gosh, does she realise what she just said? Mum didn't speak for about a week after Acne died, she didn't say much. She was just wrapped up in grief. And then when she come home, she come like she just come over to me and give me a hug, and she was just like, she started speaking. It was like, she, you know, it's sort of just a catalyst of, you know, start. It must have started something. Forgive those who sin against you, as we forgive. We expect to be forgiven. That's why I chose to forgive. Forgiving someone costs us. Forgiving someone requires us to humble ourselves. Forgiving someone can almost feel unjust, like we're letting people off without consequences. But when we forgive someone, we set ourselves free. It's like this time Jesus' friend Peter comes to him and asks, how many times should I forgive a brother or sister who sins against me? Up to seven times? And Jesus says, not seven times, 77 times. I used to read that story as Peter coming and posing Jesus a theological question, something purely hypothetical, abstract, academic. And then something happened in my life that changed how I read this story. Now, I imagine Peter almost stumbling up to Jesus with a blank stare, not quite able to take in what someone so close to him has said and done. And he asks the question through tears, how many times should I forgive a brother or sister who sins against me? Because forgiveness is not just a matter of letting things go. It is real and it is raw. And when we are hurting, that really matters. But when we bear a grudge, something happens in our hearts that is often even worse than the hurt we received in the first place. Let's listen to what Jesus says. Then Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? Up to seven times? Jesus answered, I tell you, not seven times, but 77 times. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. As he began the settlement, a man who owed him 10,000 bags of gold was brought to him. Since he was not able to pay, the master ordered that he and his wife and his children and all that he had be sold to repay the debt. At this the servant fell on his knees before him. Be patient with me, he begged, and I will pay back everything. The servant's master took pity on him, cancelled the debt and let him go. But when that servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred silver coins. He grabbed him and began to choke him. Pay back what you owe me, he demanded. His fellow servant fell to his knees and begged him, be patient with me and I will pay it back. But he refused. Instead, he went off and hand the man thrown into prison until he could pay the debt. When the other servants saw what had happened, they were outraged and went and told their master everything that had happened. Then the master called the servant in. You wicked servant, he said. I cancelled all that debt of yours because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant, just as I had on you? In anger, his master handed him over to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay back all he owed. This is how my heavenly father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother or sister from your heart. So to talk about forgiveness, Jesus tells a story about a debt that is owed. 
And if you've ever owed a debt, then maybe you've experienced that it's something you can feel quite deeply. Owing a debt can make you feel confined and restrained. Owing a debt can make you feel like when you work, you're working just to pay someone else off. Like you're not quite your own person. Almost like you belong to someone else. And people who get pulled into cycles of debt, resorting to payday loans and worse just to survive, can end up ruined and often need professional help to even manage. Some people can end up living in a constant state of despair and desperation. Imagine that feeling. Imagine that weight of debt. And now imagine being told that that debt is cancelled. It's gone. That you're never going to hear about it again. Well, how does that feel? It's that kind of freedom that God offers to every human being. It's that kind of freedom that we can give to people who have wronged us. That's why Jesus teaches his followers to pray, forgive us our debts as we forgive those who are indebted to us. Jesus reminds us that we forgive just as we are forgiven. But what about me? Why would I need to be forgiven? This is often the biggest objection people have to the Christian faith and the way of Jesus. Often they've been told a story that deep down underneath it all we're all just wicked people and we deserve hell and we ought to just be grateful that God is willing to let us off the hook. Now if that's the story that we're telling people we have to tell some pretty bad news before we get to that tiny little bit of relief that we then call good news. That version of the story takes the Bible and starts it at Genesis chapter 3 and then it goes straight to the cross and it ends the story there. It is not the full story. So we shouldn't be surprised that when people have heard that story they often reject it and say well I don't need forgiveness because I'm basically a good person. So let's begin the story at Genesis 1 instead. Let's begin by saying, yes, you are a good person, created by God in the image of God. And the first thing God says about that is, you are good. And God makes human beings with a purpose, to join in with the creativity of God, to have deep, fulfilling relationship with God, with one another and with the earth. It's a picture of peace and wholeness and value and enjoyment. And it's all summed up in one Hebrew word, shalom. But look around you. We are clearly not living in that world. Sometimes we get glimpses of that shalom, yeah. But this is clearly not the wholeness and peace that God intended us to enjoy together. One theologian described sin as the culpable disturbance of shalom. All the ways that human beings have disrupted the peace of the world, all the ways that we have contributed to conflict, all the ways that you and I have made this world anything less than whole, less than beautiful, less than perfect. Now when people hear that story, almost everyone will hold their hands up and admit that they have been part of that. Almost everyone will say yes, we are missing the mark together and as individuals. 
The good news is that God is willing and able to take care of that so that we once again experience and spread that wholeness and beauty, God's shalom in the world. See, sin is not the beginning and the end of the story. God's purpose is bigger than just dealing with sin. God deals with sin so that we can partner with God in the work of creation, redeeming, restoring. And part of that work is forgiving. When you lose someone that you love, it hurts so much and the pain is constant. The way I, I portray it, it's like having a bag or a suitcase and you, you, you're packing anger, you're packing bitterness, resentment, revenge and all the things that goes with unforgiveness. And I believe it's every weight. So I think if you offload anger, offload the bitterness, offload the anger and the, 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 all the things that goes into planning the revenge and carriage it through, that's too much. And losing my Anthony, that is a big weight to carry. And taking on those, too much for me. It would have been too much. So I chose that I do not wish to take on that. And it does help the healing process. It does help. If you know anyone who holds grudges easily, then you'll have seen what can happen. How quickly people can become bitter. How people look out at the world as though it is full of enemies. How they're just waiting for the next offence to come, always braced for pain. That is not the wholeness and fullness of life that God wants for us. And if we want to know what a world without forgiveness would look like, we can get a hint from looking at the world of social media right now. A world obsessed with blame. If someone in the social media world right now makes a mistake or uses the wrong word, their mistakes are held against them forever. There is no way back. They get cancelled. We run the risk of becoming a culture based on shame or on guilt, where there is a high price for sin, where people's behaviour is controlled by fear of making any error. What a horrible way to live. And the flip side of a world where people do not experience forgiveness is that people are then li less likely to admit wrongdoing. And rather than being sorry, people become defiant. Rather than changing their ways and learning from their mistakes, people double down on their hurtful behaviour. And that means that when there's hurt in a relationship, a romantic relationship or family relationship or friendship or international, there can be no healing. There's no opportunity to change and to grow. A world without forgiveness is a world without hope. When we choose to be people who actively forgive, we are deliberately working against that kind of blame-filled world and working towards the world as God intended it. If you harbour unforgiveness and anger and bitterness, it makes you unwell, I'd say. It's, it's, not, it's not healthy. I wouldn't say it's healthy to do that. And I think um, with me, I lost my best friend, my brother, my little brother at that. And it was hard for me at first to understand what forgiveness was. But I'm telling you now, two years on, I know what it is. And I practice it every day and it is an everyday thing. So forgiveness is not easy. Forgiveness does not mean just sweeping things under the carpet. 
Forgiveness does not mean we expect people just to get over stuff. Forgiveness does not mean that you act as though something never happened. Forgiveness does not mean that someone keeps going back to an abusive relationship. But forgiveness is freedom. It's freedom for you and for everyone who has wronged you. It's freedom to not be perfect. It's freedom to make mistakes. It's freedom to admit when we're wrong. Freedom not to be defined by those who have hurt us. Forgiveness is freedom to learn and to change and to grow. Forgiveness is freedom to become who God made you to be. Forgiveness is peace for your heart and hope for the world. We're going to pray now and we're going to do two things. We're going to admit to ourselves and to God um, our own need for forgiveness. All the ways that we have disrupted shalom, all the ways we've disturbed the peace and goodness of the world. And we're going to ask God to give us the strength to forgive and set free anyone who we have a grudge against. And this is not a little prayer. This is not an easy thing. But with God's help, we can do it. So let's pray. And God, we begin by acknowledging everything scripture tells us about you again and again, that you are good, that you are love, that you are slow to anger. And Lord, that your desire for us to be forgiven and restored and in right relationship with you is so good that you yourself became flesh. That you were even willing to take all of humanity's mess and sin and corruption on yourself from the cross. To put it to death on the cross. And to rise again so that we could live free from sin. Lord, Scripture says that in Jesus, you were not holding people's sins against them. So, Lord, we thank you for who you are. We thank you that that's your nature. And God, we're not going to lie to ourselves and pretend that... Uh, that we have no guilt. God, we don't have to think for very long before we can think of a time that we have hurt someone in our family or a friend or at work, maybe by accident or maybe deliberately. And God, we, we don't have to think very long before we can think of some stuff that we're tied up in which hurts your world and hurts others, stuff that's bad for the environment. Um, Lord, even the way we shop, um, we know that there's people further down the line in other countries who aren't getting paid enough for the clothes they make, the food we produce. God, we're all tied up in that stuff. There's not one of us is pure and innocent. And so, God, we admit our guilt and we ask for your forgiveness. We thank you, Lord Jesus, that um, when you met people who were sick in body or sick with sin, you spoke to them and said, your sins are forgiven. God, may we hear those words now. Our sins are forgiven. And just like that man who was let down on the mat in front of you by his friends, Lord, he went away leaping and dancing and praising you. God, may we... Uh, be filled with that same kind of joy for the freedom that we experience. And God, as we experience that same kind of freedom, may we want to set others free too. Lord, those who have wronged us, those who have debts to us, those who we hold grudges against, 
and we call them to mind. For some of us, this is going to be difficult. We might have to spend some time thinking if there's anyone we've been holding things against. For others, it'll be all too obvious. And Lord, thank you that in asking us to forgive, you're not saying our hurt doesn't matter. You're not telling us just to, um, to get up and get on with it and forget what happened. Lord, you know uh, every human heart. God, everyone who's participating in this service, Lord, you see their hearts. You see uh, the hurts and the history and the scars. But Lord, you're longing for us to be set free from the grudges that we hold. And you're longing, us to, longing for us to set others free too. God, because the world you want, a redeemed world, a whole world, means people can change. People can be redeemed. People can find their way to you. So Holy Spirit, give us your strength to forgive. God, forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Amen. Amen.
Now is that time when we get to share together in this meal that Jesus gave us. And remember, when Jesus uh, gathered his friends together around the table, uh, he knew that he was going to the cross. Uh, but though he had predicted his death several times, his, his disciples, his friends did not know what was going to happen. And so as they shared the traditional Passover meal, uh, when Jesus took the bread, instead of saying the, the usual prayers, Jesus said, uh, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And he took the cup and instead of saying the usual prayer, said, this is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. And so um, his disciples were left wondering what this could mean. Uh, that when they ate and drank, they were to do it in remembrance of Jesus, in remembrance of his life, which was for them, and his blood that was shed for them for the forgiveness of sins. And so we're going to share in that meal together now. Uh, and when it comes time to receive the bread and wine, um, I'll tear off a piece of bread and receive. And as I do that, you do the same at home at the same time. And when it comes to the cup, uh, the same thing. We'll receive at the same time together. There's some words for us to think about and to say together to help us prepare um, to think about what this means. And so I encourage you when there's words uh, in, uh, in capital letters, that those are the words that we will say together. Let's pray. The Lord is here. His spirit is with us. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give thanks and praise. Lord of all life, you created an amazing universe. All creation reflects your glory. You give us this great and beautiful earth to discover and to cherish. You made all of us, each wonderfully different. We join with the angels and sing your praise. Holy Holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. We thank you, loving Father, because when we turned away from you, you sent Jesus, your son. He shows us the way to live and gave his life for us on the cross. But the grave could not hold him. And with a love stronger than death, you raised him to life again. Dying, he destroyed our death. Rising, he restored our life. Lord Jesus, come in glory. On the night before he was betrayed, at supper with his friends, he took bread, gave thanks, and broke it. He gave it to each of them saying, take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after supper, he took the cup. 
and said, this cup is my blood, the new covenant. My blood shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. So, Father, with this bread and this cup, we celebrate his love, his death, his risen life, and together declare our faith in Jesus. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. So now we share the bread and the cup together. The body of Christ, which is given for us. The blood of Christ shed for us. We pray together. Lord our God, we give you thanks. By Jesus' death and resurrection, you have saved us from the power of sin and death and invited us to share in the risen life of Jesus. Sustained by this bread and wine, May we live our lives for you in the strength of your love and the power of your spirit. Amen. Amen.
So may you know what it is to be completely forgiven and completely set free. And may you know the freedom of forgiving others. In Jesus' name, Amen.